Okie dokie, hello everybody. Uh, today I'm reading Herndon Chakrabarty's Individual and Collective Pride because, uh, there we go, because uh, he's, he's in town. He's teaching a class here over the summer and he emailed this to me because we had a conversation about some stuff. Uh, so, there is a trivial sense in which all pride is individual. As a mental state of disposition and an emotional attitude, it must belong ultimately to a single person. A number of people cannot share any share of pride any more literally than they can share that is at the same anger, although they can all be proud of or angry with the same or similar objects. Already, I think we need a sort of like emotion entry in a hypernomicon. Then under the emotion entry, we put pride. And then under pride, we put can pride be shared? And we have our ending saying no. Where do we put the emotions? Do we just, is it just going to be like a debate? Emotion. And this is just going to be a position. And then we just paste. Okay, but the crucial occurrence of the first person pronoun in the pride expressing sentence is not the first one, but the second one. Uh, that is, I am proud that I have written a bestseller. What makes pride to cleave the same trinity as the innumerable pro pronominal? A uh, pronominal reference to oneself inside the proposition which gives the basis or reason for the particular confessed pride. Pride is eliminably, ineliminably egocentric. He says, typically. Uh, then we're, we're not going to create a position for that. Uh, typically egocentric is the ineliminably pronominal reference to oneself inside the preposition which gives the basis of reason for the particular confessed pride. Uh, even if this essential association with the ego, once the Sanskrit general word for pride there are actually a few general words like dampa, darpa, atimana, meanings of which are distinguished by the commentators on the Bhagavad Gita. They capture pride of possessions, pride of virtuousness, demanding respect from others, etc. The last word literally means too much of a sense of prestige. Uh, the Sanskrit general word for pride, ahamkara, literally use of the word I, is left deliberately or carelessly unclear, one can always demand clarification. If you tell me I'm proud that Sheila has such a golden voice, I can always ask you why, until you clarify in some way, such as Sheila is my daughter. So then eventually it's to be filled with, I am proud that I have a daughter with such a golden voice. Now it's this first person pronoun, which is sometimes in the singular and sometimes in the plural. It's either pride that I have F. My cat's doing some weird stuff. Uh, it's pride that I have F or pride that we have F, when F, roughly speaking, is an admirable thing or quality or performance. The pride whose propositional content alludes reflexively to a single person, I call individual pride. The cat's really up to stuff. Uh, collective pride is the name for what is expressed typically as pride that we, when we, can stand for family, ancestral lineage, the club, the race, the nation, or the language group, the party, the gender, the era, or in the limited case, the species to which the proud person belongs or thinks she belongs. Maybe we put individual and collective pride under pride, not for now. In this paper, I'll try to first 
I'll first try to analyze the concept of individual pride causally, epistemically, epistemologically, logically, and ethically on the basis that some conclusions reached. I shall then try to make some remarks on collective pride. Apart from catering to the intrinsic interest in the fairly common but not clearly understood human trait, which now appears to be a virtue and now a vice, I hope to be able to expose the mistaken tendency that many of us, though not surely, though surely not all, have of thinking that some forms of collective pride are morally excusable or even commendable. Another way of formulating my target of attack would be as follows. It's a widespread belief that the larger and more inclusive the group with which I identify myself and feel collectively proud, the less morally objectionable is the pride. In the most serious conversations, implicit cultural and national pride counts as more pardonable than implicit individual pride. Collective humility surely is much less strongly recommended than personal humility. Sometimes in more modern societies, the integration of one's own class, culture, or country is practiced as a social grace, but there I imagine this distinctive ability to perceive the faults of one's own group is flaunted as a matter of second level individual collective pride. Uh, consider Hume's treatise, book two, part one, section nine. Uh, there are some that discover vanity of an opposite kind and affect and appreciate their own country in comparison to those which they have traveled. These persons find that the strong relation betwixt them and their own nation is shared with so many that tis in a manner lost to them, whereas their distant relation to a foreign country is augmented by their considering how few there are who have it, seen it and lived it. I shall argue for the conditional conclusion that if we are absolutist or objectives about the value of cultures, then we have to regard all cultural pride as morally wrong. By transposition, if we have to retain the permissibility of collective cultural and national pride, then we have to give up the claim that one culture or nation can be superior to superior or inferior to another in a transcendent objective absolute sense. I'm not prescribing total elimination of the cohesive but essentially prideful notion of my own country or our civilization, only the value scale which gives meaning to cultural pride will have to be relativistic, hence their respective cultures will all come out excellent, but only trivially so by their own standards. The somewhat unrealistic advice of unconditional surrender of cultural prides is often motivated by a dream of one borderless human society. This dream in its turn often involves a more or less articulate species pride, the glory of being human. Even this form of collective pride I hope to show is either senseless or immoral. Sounds like a good plan. I'm on board so far. In common parlance, we use both de and de dicta formulations for pride describing sentences. I mean, my, the, the cat is really up to something. You go, girl. Uh, we say that someone's proud of or son or takes pride in his academic record or is proud to suffer for a noble cause. After Davidson, I shall reduce all these cases in general to propositional pride, uh, but in a sense, to pride that something is the case. Since humans insist on pride, and its opposite humility being simple and analyzable felt and direct passions, both of which have the self as their object, he was troubled by the fact that the same individual could at the same time be proud and humble, say proud of her intellect and humble about her looks. Kitty cat. Uh, his way of solving this issue was by drawing a distinction between the cause and the object of pride. Though the object is always the same, the ego, the causes could be different. But as Davidson suggests, a better way to handle simultaneous presence of vanity and shame, or distinct vanities for that matter, is to give the single contest to pride rather than themselves, rather than only to the beliefs that cause prides, hence making pride cognitively scrutable. This thus seemed to be possible for me not only to be ashamed that my car is old and defective, and at the same time to be proud that I have a beautiful house, but also possible to be proud and not proud of the same achievement, like winning a war against a weaker country, because it's excellent in one respect and abominable in another, which can come out in the two different net clauses which give the contents of pride and humility, respectively. Hume's causal picture, Hume's use of notion, notions of the subject and object of pride is odd, while I'm proud of the beautiful garden, cause the garden the subject and myself the object, is because Hume thinks that the belief that the garden is caught pretty causes a pride which in turn causes me to think of myself. Hume's causal picture has many flaws. It misleads us to suppose that in the initial assessments of the merit or value of the cause of pride, the self does not figure at all. The tendency to regard something as meritorious because it is first found to be one's own is a common human failing, but the converse tendency to be a, to appropriate something as one's own because it's found on objective grounds to be valuable is hardly ascribable even to the vainest of persons. It's associated more with theft and plagiarism. You can decide to support a football team initially because you consider it to be the, the best team, but once you do so, your pride in it has to be an effect rather than a cause of considering it to be your own team. Okay. This human himself lays down the first of his five constraints in the pride principle. Uh, the pleasurable or laudatory appreciation of an object will not encourage pride unless in the first place the object is felt to be closely related to the proud person himself or herself. I can adore a piece of music or love a poem, but I would not feel proud or ashamed of it unless I somehow relate myself rather, rather closely to it. Of course, this notion of closeness of relation hardly captures anything one eminent male. <laughs> 
Uh, philosopher told me sincerely that he felt genuinely ashamed once at the way gender was chasing the way a gander was chasing and pestering a bunch of helpless geese. The only imaginable relation here, namely born to the same gender, is indeed very tenuous and remote. Aside from this dubious constraint on closeness in relationship with the ego, or other constraints of humor, quite instructive. Mm. So we're getting causal constraints on pride. And I'm thinking maybe we stick them all in, or to hypernomicon. We're at least putting in pride as contents. Let's see what the next four constraints are, because these sound like the good ones. Uh, the cause of pride, a house, a talent, a title, etc., must be something peculiar to that is something peculiar that is exceptional to him. It must be noticeable by others as something exceptional in him. It must be relatively content or stable, and it must be assessed by appeal to some general rules or norms of expectation. This last point is very important. The norm that sanctions excellence to be the proud making property must be general in two senses. It must be generally accepted in the community where the pride is manifested. I cannot be proud of a property which only I myself can in principle appreciate as valuable. Secondly, I can be prepared to grant the legitimacy of the same degree of pride in another person if she has the same valuable property. This doesn't entail that there must be one universal and unchanging standard for evaluating pride worthiness of the person who belongs, their talent, or features. What is pride generating in an Indian village may be quite pedestrian in New York and vice versa. A four year old can be proud of a drawing or a bunch of grown up artists should be ashamed. It seems clear, therefore, that three beliefs are necessary for something, someone to be proud. First, the belief that she has F. Second, the belief that F is a good thing to have, not necessarily in a moral sense of good. Third, the belief that she alone is F or is one of the few, blah, blah. Um. I don't know. Why not? Why? Why not? Why can't I be proud of a property which only I myself can in principle appreciate as valuable? So like why not LGBT pride in a society that doesn't appreciate it as valuable? Why not? Like I'm really proud of this water bottle even if Nobody thinks it's valuable except me. While I think about that, this should really be pride has like, I don't know what we call the contents. What does Davidson call the contents? I don't know. It's not like mental contents, it's like determinable. I don't know. We're not, we're not going to fill it out because. Well, you know, we're, we're putting them all in. We're putting them all in. Because why not?
something it, it won't let me won't let me edit what's going on Hypernomicon is uh, screwing up let's try Either. Let's save to X minus. That seems sort of like we're just we're just restarting Hypernomicon. That's what we're gonna do. Oh, something just. Uh, okay, no, that's a separate problem. Uh, okay, restart. See my streaming setup here. Do, 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 do. Now it's working. Don't know what I did. This can be made most convincing by observing the three alternative ways of displaying someone's pride. S is pride that S himself is F can be shattered either by pointing out that he doesn't have F, or by proving that F is not a good thing at all, or by proving that everyone or nearly everyone of S's kind has F. So, proving to him, presumably, not to like other people around him, which is why I'm skeptical of D. However, obvious all that may appear, the second and third conditions are difficult to generalize. In a hilarious essay, Russell wonders why people boast of exceptional illnesses and delicate health when they feel depressed to learn that someone else has had a disease that was deadlier than their own, while one is never proud of a car which is perpetually going out of order. I think this happens because uh, the importance of a third or rareness condition. I wish he'd cited this. Uh, I think they, uh, this happens because the importance of a third or rareness condition outbalances the goodness condition. We all like to be exceptional, but we cannot afford to excel in pleasant and fair ways. We try to do so in unpleasant and unfair ways. But is the rareness condition itself so sacrosanct? Pride, like joy, which can, with which it can be compared and contrasted by Hume, can take place in something quite common and unsurprising too. For one has often heard people say, I'm proud to be a woman, or I'm proud that somehow I've made it till the end, even if everyone who took part in the marathon did so and I come last. There can be several explanations of this. The most uninteresting is the suggestion of that, that sometimes I am proud is a rebellious way of stating I'm not ashamed, but I think there's much more there's more to say such pride in widely shared properties. Womanhood, however, on rare may be felt to be overridingly meritorious, and the pride might deserve exhibition, especially in a society where the equally unacceptable feature of masculinity is high, regarded too highly. That's the power, which means that's my PDF. How's everybody doing today? I'm sure there's nobody in the chat room. I feel like every time I stream, there's a bunch of like bots in the chat room or whatever. When I click on users in chat, it says there's zero super, zero ax2, zero niva, 420, f1t, cool, Lexus, Nexus, Delta. Okay, the power is back. So the goodness condition weighs over the rareness condition. In the case of a person who's proud to have been the slowest runner, his self-image may be so poor, or he may be classifying himself into a category of people too old and firm or obese for whom it's so unusual to run a race at all that finishing a run is a rare achievement for him. And finally, such statements of pride in the humdrum might be a display of humility rather than pride. Here, once again, the statement by showing lack of high expectations out of oneself perhaps shows off modesty. 
Uh, ability to laugh at one's own failure when advertised can sometimes manifest not pride in defeat, but pride in the rare ability to take defeat with good humor. If this constellation of beliefs and proud attitudes is necessary for pride, it's surely not sufficient. A proud person also has some expectations from others. She's not just pleased with herself. She wants to bring about certain cognitive and effective states in others, namely that they recognize her possession of the qualities and admire them as rare and excellent. Is that true? Can I not just be proud on the inside? This is why pride is impossible for a solitary individual. It flourishes in and, self and is self-described and other described in the context of a community of people. I don't think I buy that. I don't think I buy any of that. I don't see why you can't just be proud of something you've done on a desert island without sort of having any clue whether it's special or not, just because you yourself take it to be. Correspondingly, humility is analyzed by the 12th century theologian St. Bernard as having a cognitive and cognitive aspect, cognitive humility. Cognitive, that's the word I wanted earlier. Pride is cognitive contents. Cognitive humility consists of having a low opinion of oneself, and cognitive humility is desiring others to have similar contempt for you. Spinoza is rejection of humility by the virtue of well known. Also, notice that pride encourages flattery, and this is why a constant refusal by others to recognize someone's superiority or excellence usually results in gradual atrophy of pride. Sometimes such frustrated desire for recognition converts the pride to second order shame, unless it turns out into something more pathological. Summarized, therefore, individual pride could be roughly stated as a unique emotional state which has its cognitive core proposition of which the proud person reflexively identified as the subject in some quality regarded as rare and or excellent. The predicate, its cognitive aspect, consists in a desire to get others with a community where the pride finds its context to recognize that such a rare and excellent property really belongs to the person in question. Not on board so far. Uh, we not only ascribe pride to others, but very often to ourselves, but very often, in fact, more to others. Of course, unlike humility, pride can be unfeelingly self described. To say I am humble is not to express humility at all. It sounds like you're explaining to moral pride. Uh, sometimes, of course, the more effective way to display even pride is to drop the self description and just come up with what we've been calling the propositional content of pride. Thus, when I say simply that I wrote a path breaking paper on logic, others can say about me, or in the most proud that he wrote a path breaking paper on logic. The question I want to ask in this section is whether the people can say this when they know that. I did not write any such paper. For the logical powers of pride describing sentences, S is proud that P is it S believes that P or S desires that P or S is worried that P, which does not entail P, or is it like S knows that P, S regrets that P, or S is surprised that P, which does entail the truth of P? That's an interesting question. It's got to be the first answer, right? <laughs> We notice these two types of propositional attitude verbs in ordinary language. Verbs like believes, wishes, wonders provide what we might call non factive context, whereas verbs like knows, regrets, forgot provide factive context and factive context to that. So, apart from introducing the propositional object of the attitude of verb, our adjective also seems to function as and, committing us to the truth of the proposition that follows. Thus, when someone says Miss Thatcher is happy that Mr. Bush won, 
One gets committed to asserting that Mr. Bush is one. This becomes clear if we assert her now before the left is happy now or later. Uh, my linguistic intuition tells me that his problem makes a fact of context so that when I assert S is proud of the P, I get committed along with S to the truth of P. No way. This is corroborated by the following diagnosis of both him and Davidson. When I'm a proud person or self or someone else is describing this specific of pride, what follows S is proud that gives both the cause and the reason for her pride. I think this is just, you know, S is proud that XYZ. If you just chop off X is proud, that XYZ is like that's factor. Like that it's two o'clock in the morning entails it's two o'clock in the morning or whatever. Uh, now when I call something the cause of event, I get committed to its factor. Right, but you don't I think the proud that P locution is effective, but is proud to have. Okay, now maybe I'm coming around. Hold on. Random is proud. You no, know, even the, that is not fact. Mm, now I'm wavering. I should just keep reading. Under normal circumstances, to say that S is proud because S has F is to imply that S does have F. But that of S is proud that P claims. Or behaves like because, of course, a clause following because is consequent is not quite so transparently used to tolerate any old substitution of co-reference or similar terms. The mode of presentation of the pride grounding property is important for description of pride having been to itself. This is not quite like adding clause by him. Um, if we want to disclaim the actual other P, we're expected to specifically introduce in the past the introducing method lack of like word, like S is proud that P, B, S, S is under the impression that P, or S is proud of thinking that P, but such descriptions of pride are often subconscious descriptions of false pride. We shall come back to false pride again. The particular logical feature of pride synthesis, which I call factiveness, will be crucial for our observations on collective pride. Let's now proceed to the second. Interesting. Ow. Cat just <laughs> got my foot. But, uh, what? Are you sneezing or are you about to barf? I think the cat's like sneezing or something. So I, now I'm, now I'm unsure, but I'm still leaning in the direction of my original tendency, which was contra Chakrabarty. I'm going to not make up my mind. I'm just going to keep reading. That's a good question. Pride occupies an ambivalent position between two sets of ethically thick concepts, one of which is definitely positively valued, while the other is regarded as definitely offensive qualities. The admirable neighbors of pride are magnanimity, honor, dignity, self respect, self confidence, reserve. The negatively valued relatives are, of course, vanity, conceit, arrogance, falseness, haughtiness, and perdition. So now it's pride of virtue or vice. Aristotle in the pagan ethos regards it unambiguously as a virtue. Christian morality generally regards it as a definite vice. The Hindu ethics functionally regards a variety of pride as a requisite quality in a soldier, but always a damaging defect in a scholar or an aesthetic. Spinoza regards excessive pride and excessive humility to be equally pernicious, both because springing from the importance of the mind. But before we diagnose such wide diversion of opinion, we must notice that each of these philosophers or traditions has meant slightly different things by pride. Aristotle's definition precludes a false pride because he says that a man who is proud of, thinks of himself worthy of great things being worthy of them. That's his mind. Incidentally, this supports our conclusion that calling someone proud on account of a proud behavior is inflictable. Well, okay, sure, but Aristotle's special. Um, let's, uh, you know, while we're at it, let's put Aristotle in here. We got Wang yesterday and Aristotle today.
what do we want to say? Um, No, you know what we do? We put try descriptions are factive. Uh, let's actually, let's go to the is called great sold. A uh, person is thought to be great sold if he thinks himself worthy of great things and is indeed worthy of them. This actually is a magnum in any of it. view on uh, ba -ba -ba. and uh, Aristotle distinguishes genuine pride from vanity which we can call false pride remembering that it's not a variety of pride at all just out of false appearance it is not pearls the vain too have grown up suffering much but they are not worthy of it thus Hobbes distinguishes between glory and vainglory but interestingly enough only calls the rabbit pride classic Hobbes uh, but, but, but apart from excellent detailing use of crowd Aristotle has an articulate Preference for a self admiring person as opposed to the humble one. Yeah, so let's do pride as a virtue. Well, yeah, let's do pride as a virtue. And this goes also under Aristotle. Just as pride for Aristotle means genuine excellence, the goodness of the highest of the highest degree, a sort of crown of excellence is what makes them greater is not found without them. And uh, forget, yeah. uh, humility means a generally low opinion about oneself, irrespective of whether one actually is so low or not. Now, if a person is actually objectively meritorious, morally ex excellent, talented, physically beautiful, etc., and yet is humble, one can look upon his humility as a moral flaw because it simply consists in lack of self knowledge due to ignorance of self deception. Uh, we're going to finish reading this, but there's a point to be made about this. Aristotle hints at another reason for disapproving of such self-denigration that are truly meritorious at best. It could be due to their unwillingness to judge oneself by any but the very highest standards. If, looking at his own exalted endowments, he finds himself very deficient, at what uh, would he have done if they, his endowments had been less? Thus he transpires to be unrealistically vain person at bottom by having absurdly high expectations of himself. If the other hand is high low opinion about himself is found to be more grounded than facts, then he must be truly lacking in excellence. So humility, uh, temperate, classic cat behavior, uh, temperate and accurate and low uh, self-assessment or undue and accurate, inaccurate and low self-assessment is always unattractive. All this extolling of pride, so yeah, we're, we're also putting a humility entry now. And then, whoops, not a position, it's a debate. And we're actually 
give pride. Pride will have a search key. And uh, what's the the debate under this, or the position under this? Humility is bad. His advice. should what is the lesbian rule in Aristotle? Um is he taught where is he humility? So does Aristotle actually say anything explicit about humility? Maybe not. But I'm, I'm still so tempted to drag humility as a vice uh, down under Aristotle just because it sort of really matches that guy's vibe. Um, we're not going to do it right now. Julia Driver has this whole thing about uh, how humility is interesting because it's a virtue, but of course it's, it's got to be a flaw. You've got to be making a mistake to be humble by underrating yourself. So she thinks it's got to be an inaccurately low self-estimate. Uh, so it has to be undue, uh, and yet it's a virtue, she thinks. All this extolling of pride, in spite of the recognition that pride brings disdain for the mediocre and belittling of humility, even if it consists of an accurate knowledge of one's own limitless, strikes us as odd. But we must remember that Aristotle's proud hero is all, almost the ideal human being, the person of, with firm wisdom of the Bhagavad who will neither be overjoyed by good fortune nor overly pained by evil. In paradigmic dignity, he walks in majestic slow steps and speaks in a deep voice, has a handsome body and a noble mind. Such a proud person is the exact opposite of the proud person, St. Bernard, who speaks in. While the former is indifferent and curious, reticent, and reserved, the latter is inquisitive, gossipy, talkative. He must give a talk of bursting frivolous. I don't know if it's fair to say Aristotle, this dude is like indifferent and incurious. Reticent, reserved, perhaps. Even that's a little unfair, but you know, I, I get what he's saying. Uh, one can try to reconcile these two faces of pride by distinguishing between proper pride and false pride. So apparently, apparently, it's the first which Aristotle is. It, Extort, extols and the second which Christianity decries, but this does not work if we take Kant's use of proper pride. Ooh, here comes Kant. Should he be called Emmanuel Kant? No. Proper pride is love of honor, which is a refusal to sink beneath the human dignity of one's moral life. It's the recognition of one's intrinsic worth by virtue of which one is not for sale at any price. Kant, that's not, that's not the citation. Uh, okay, there's a, a doctrine of the virtue. So we need metaphysics or uh, Do we need that or do we need... Just Kant's practical philosophy. Let's do practical Oh, I saw that. Oh, actually, I have a fancier copy downloaded here. Okay, what are we looking at? Doctrine of Virtue, section 12, 353. my table of contents. Oh Jesus, it's not going to be free. 
a table of contents. Sorry, what are we looking for? Section 12 on servility. No, fuck, I went, this is the wrong book. I don't want the Memphis and Morals. I want the uh, Critique of Practical Reason. Is this in here? Yeah, it is. 133. Embarrassing gaff. Luckily, nobody's watching. And we don't have a table of contents for the critique either. Section seven, section eight. To, oh god. Analytic of where just control effing what's it called? Humility? Servility. This is section four. Oh no, he's introducing it in here. So next. Here we go, on servility. He says section 12. Yes, it keeps going. Okay, so. Cut, sorry, this is pretty small for you guys. Respect for himself. Hmm. What do we say about Kant and pride and humility? Just uh, uh, just put the citation in. It's almost like humility descriptions are effective for Kant because uh, he is true and false humility. So he's sort of the mirror of Aristotle. So let's put that in. And you know what? Let's put humility involves the mistake.
And let's just paste in all this stuff because it's cool. True humility follows unavoidably from our sincere and exact comparison. So with more laws, we will subscript to input from our capacity for an eternal law giving and from the natural human beings feeling feeling himself can be able to live the moral humility in the itself. At the same time there comes exaltation. Actually no, we don't need all this. Humility is a virtue. Humility is a virtue. Humility descriptions are factive. Humility is not a duty. So this is, mm, humility and comparing oneself to other human beings is not a duty, but is humility with respect to the moral law a duty? You should not disavow a moral self-esteem that such a being pursue them, which is itself a duty. And the self-esteem is the duty of the human being to himself. not going to sort <coughs> that out, but I am going to put in self-esteem, which we're going to be pride. Pride is a duty. He must regard himself as a person, but generally as a human being, as a person whose duties and reasons as his opponent, his insignificance as a human animal. He may not infringe upon his consciousness of his dignity as a rational human being. He should not disavow the moral self-esteem as such a being that pursues them, not abjectly, as a servile spirit. Animal servilt. As if you were receiving a favor, and this self esteem is a duty of the human being to himself. Pride is a duty, says Immanuel Kant, assuming pride is self esteem, which we're just going to go with. And we're going to leave Kant open because. You always want to leave Kant open. To have the sort of feeling of earned or worth is regarded by Kant as a duty to oneself. What synchronicity? I did not plan that. He even says somewhat religiously, kneeling down and prostrating oneself on the ground, even as an outward sign of veneration for holy things is contrary to the dignity of humanity. But this sort of self-respect hardly meets our criteria of pride. Oh no. Surely this is not enough to make someone an Aristotle's cruel uppish hero. Yeah, that's right. Pride is a duty gets unattached from Kant. And instead we create a new one called self-esteem. 
self-respect. And that's the duty. The Kantian dignified moral agent has no tendency to distinguish oneself from other fellow humans and no demand of special recognition from them. Such honor is a stoic virtue, which is quite compatible with humility. Indeed, insofar as Kant conceives his proper pride as the reverence shown by every man uh, toward the moral law in him, to, toward the moral man in him, it promotes what he calls true humility, the awareness of one running significance in comparison with the inexorable moral law within itself. To avoid confusion, let's not call us pride at all. Because we do want to keep pride and humility incompatible, and our use of pride must have something to do with self-description and being exceptional and excellence and desire to bask in the head. Uh, admire and intention. Yes, that is all correct. Good point. If we stick to our definition of individual pride, we can immediately see that it's an unjust emotion because its cognitive content, insofar as it involves considering oneself truly exceptional, is not universalizable. Pride remains wrong even when it's based on a true or unexaggerated self description and excellence because it demands from others a respect which it denies to most of them. For me to will that every other person be proud that he or she has excellence, F is for me to will that he or she really have F because pride descriptions are factored in the way shape of love. But to will that every other person have F is to therefore permit F to be to cease to be a pragmatic property. Thus, I cannot will the maximum of pride to be a universal law without willing to make the proud making property universally available, hence unrare and commonplace. No said this way of proving the unfairness of individual pride is not all dependent on the pride of pride being false or undeserved, but the crucial point, on the contrary, is dependent on the pride being factive. It can be rather it can rather be related at the bottom with Nietzsche's point. The true pride is deadly offensive. Uh, when the unmeritorious takes pride and can be tolerated or ignored is foolish, but since the merit is so offensive because ungeneralizable, pride is of the meritorious pride of the meritorious becomes even more repulsive. Mm -hmm. Acts which in fact are in fact exceptional can be universalizable under an uncompetitive description like solving a mind body problem. They will be unjust when done under a description giving a solution to the mind body problem which is better than anybody else's. We must remember, of course, that the only competitive recognition of hungry ambitious sort of pride which fails to pass the universal you know. Must remember, of course, the only competitive murderer. Another morally self reverent person, nor the Nietzschean hero who does great things when obstrusively without feeling competition with others before others, has a pride which is universalizable or has some constant anxiety to defend his privileged position. Surely, the above proof of the unjustness of pride takes the universalizability criterion of justness for granted, and where the special problem universalizability faces when justifying any exceptional excellence. But even if we try giving an alternative hedonistic account of the rightness of pride, even if we try giving an alternative hedonistic account of rightness, pride will come out as wrong. For pride, I can show in the final analysis, for uh, is in the final analysis an unpleasant emotion, both for the proud person and those with whom he shares the pride making property, and for those whom he looks down on. It breeds insecurity. Competition is jealousy. One good thing about collective pride seems to be that it is a tendency to curve or neutralize individual pride. One often takes pride in one's family or school by stating how unexceptional routine one's own performance or achievement is compared to others of the same family or school. Similarly, the glory of greater collections tends to render the excellence of smaller groups less and less worthy of exhibition. But does, the mean, does that mean that collective pride is any more excusable or less offensive than individual pride? Hume makes a straight remark that vanity is rather to be esteemed as a social passion and the bond of union among men. Boop. Nationalism, patriotism, and political party pride are such cozy forces that they do promote integrity and protect social groups from aggression and absorption by stronger groups, but they also encourage large scale combativeness, cultural insularity, and communal hatred. Schopenhauer decries national pride as cheap precisely because it levels out individual excellences and provides a generic refuge to those who lack self confidence and individual merit. Classic Schopenhauer. While the commendable forms of Collective pride or patriotism, commitments to one's their community, rudeness in one's culture, the contemptible forms of pride are too well known. Racism, jingoism, cultural chauvinism, the religious myth of the chosen people are easily recognizable as obnoxious, but the more paternalistic forms of cultural pride, which come in the form of not wishing to judge alien or primitive societies by one's own exacting standards, or readiness to explain away and put up with atrocities, 
too easily as due to different value systems are harder to recognize. Modern societies tend to practice some sort of collective self mortification by being cynical about the domestic and over forever that would fall in. But we must be as suspicious of excessive group humility as we have to be cautious against individual adverse values. Sometimes, of course, the very content of collective pride precludes competitiveness or intolerance. If a certain cultural or religious group feels proud they have all, that they are the only people who have the Catholicity to honor the value of all other cultures of the truth and all other creeds, such a pride kept within limits should be less harmful and less ennobling than others. And so far, as collective pride, too, is after all felt by individuals is based on more or less relation with the self or the proud person. It can be said in that it can be in that sense always reduced to individual pride. Americans pride that we Americans, the most prosperous nation in the world, can be reduced to the pride that she herself belongs to the American nation, which etc. But in this individualized form, national cultural pride are easily seen to be ununiversalizable, especially in the international or transcultural context where prides can be pointfully shown off. Uh, unlike individual pride, which can be well deserved in certain cases, especially when the pride making excellence is hard earned, collective pride is often very undeserved, is very often undeserved. So I think we, we have one argument against collective pride, which is this um, universalization thing that also works against individual pride. I think we're getting a second one. So this is just going to be pride is bad, and then collective pride is bad, I think. Do we have a pride is bad yet? Pride is, do we have pride is a vice? I don't, I don't know. Is this guy... Is, this guy, I know him. He's Chuck Liberty saying it's a vice. Why am I scrolling down? An unpleasant emotion. Pride is wrong. So I was asking, is it bad or is it a vice? Maybe we should just say pride is wrong. And over here it's unjust. Unjust is just wrong, right? Yeah, he says, even if it will come out as wrong, and so it's, it's wrong, 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 wrong. Pride is wrong. Argument number one, pride is not universalizable. So number one, pride is bad because you can't universalize it. And then this could be collective pride is bad. Where did I stop reading? Here. Unlike individual pride, which can be well deserved in certain cases, especially when the pride making excellence is hardly is hard earned, collective pride is very often undeserved. So is collective shame. The individuals who feel these emotions hardly have any choice or responsibility in bringing about the noble or lowly thing which makes them feel proud or ashamed. The illiterate Bengali feels proud of divorce poetry, the conscientious American feels ashamed of Vietnam, one feels the irrationality of such emotions but cannot therefore help feeling them, even unavoidable individual prides are often based on truthful recognition of quite unjust features like noticeable good looks or congenital talents. What we shall be examining, however, is whether such pride becomes any more commendable when it's more widely shown. I don't know. Uh, collective pride is irrational. The, do I want to...
Yeah, let's put the collective pride in the explicit we form of the test of universalizability. Perhaps I'm proud of Indians that we have the greatest music in the world. On the cruise level, I can't at the same time, well, the English, the American, the African, and the Japanese should also be proud of the greatest music. These guys have to be proud of that. They have all of the best music, and uh, they won't have to have the best music, in which case ours will already really remain the best or even one of the few musical traditions. It will not do to try to save the universalizability by introducing the dogs that I have no objection to their believing that they do have the best musical tradition. As far as I've argued about, for me to wish the Germans to be proud that they produced the greatest music, was for me to wish that it be true that they did. Otherwise, all I'm ready to universalize is false collective pride. As in the case of truer, well-deserved individual pride, the truer cultural groups claim to excellence in a particular respect, the less sincerely can be the pride, can the pride be willing to be universalized. So, to come up with Considerations like, so what if the Americans deny the great music tradition of their own, they have time and technology, it makes the national pride all the more offensive when they have time to get down. Correct. Uh, one must go logically a little deeper to see the point here. Even if we ignore the ring of patronizing condescension about the move, let every country have something to be proud of when something need not be the same future possession. The universalization here takes the form for all X. There is Y such that effects in the country, X is part of Y. This might just have pride in something or the other, but doesn't just have pride in music, pride in military power, which is... Uh, what people collectively flaunt, just having pride in something or the other hardly gets the same word because there is, that is nearly indiscernible of a certain sort of balanced state of contentment and humility. Sounds right. Um, let's just add The less shallow way out is to relativize excellence to standard internal or to standards internal to a nation culture. Thus, while I can be proud that we Indians have the greatest music by Indian standards, I can allow that every other cat just jumped on the shelf. Uh, I can allow that every other nation be proud that they have the greatest music by their standards. This sort of ours is the best for us move lies at the back of most moral recommendations of moderate collective pride. While we give them a claim that there's absolute transcultural universal standards of judging the worth of cultures themselves, within the culture we can retain objectivity and norms for evaluating individual accomplishments of every culture that is the set of norms which are eminently objective uh, is to be judged only by its own standards. Each of them will come out as excellent and unique and non-jealous collective pride will be trivially universalized unless it's a self-hating culture but whatever um so this is really a disjunctive i mean we know this already he said this in the introduction but this is a disjunctive collective pride is wrong or we relativize pride as pride determinations to cultures and there's no great way to put that in hypernomicon right now so i'll just say that i'll put it in the collective pride is wrong directed pride in our sense insofar as other groups in comparison to which a member of the community will feel proud about a certain communal feature will not abide by the same standard of evaluation Hume's fourth last constraint will not be fulfilled this is this fourth constraint is the one I like the least must be assessed by appeal to some general rules or norms of expectation Also, such competitive pride will not come with expectations of recognition of the exceptional merit from members of other groups. It will be as universal as a simple love, a family, or devotion to one's own culture, which doesn't await any comparative estimate. And was that expectation of. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't big on that either, but whatever. The price we pay to make such collective pride morally permissible is that this drastic mitigation of our claim of exceptional excellence. Alternatively, one might exist upon a universal moral scale and transcultural scale for rating civilizations themselves. Cultural pride would then be meaningful and non-trivial, but then to that extent it would be equally unfair and self-accepting. I don't see how such cultural pride can be universalized, given the logical pride of describing sentences that we have decided upon. We might not help 
having such pride, but we <laughs> we better not be proud of it. Before I conclude, I must return to the widespread notion of species pride, which I mentioned at the outset. We have reason to have uh, but low opinion of ourselves as individuals, but as representatives of mankind, we ought to hold ourselves in high regard. Clearly recommending species pride. He's clearly recommending rational creature pride, I think. Um, he doesn't even like our animal nature. Uh, about non-humans, even if they have the social structures indeed some of them seem to have, we can either take the position that they are incapable of having self-consciously assessed cultural, moral, aesthetic qualities or achievements. Bertrand Russell enthusiastically uphold his position, claiming man alone of living beings has shown himself capable of the knowledge required to give him a certain mastery over the environment. We can pardon his pronouns when enslaving the rest of the environment, even if exclusive to humans is morally no better than quality than enslaving other humans. Uh, alternatively, we can hold on the evidence of the collective building skills of some ants and fidelity, etc. of dogs, that they too can have shared features of bearing excellence and can be proud or ashamed of those. If we hold the former view, then our pride of human as human beings makes no, no sense because we do not have outwards to compare our excellences with or expect recognition of, or super, of superiority from. If we hold the latter view, then our pride as humans remains ungeneralizable because we cannot will at all one human to be as proud of us as species pride is either senseless or immortal. Work on this paper was supported by blah blah blah. I'm grateful to blah 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 and Joe Wolf. So I don't like two or three of the four human conditions. I don't think I like any of them really. I don't know. This is a stream for research, not a stream for, th I guess thinking about what I think about this stuff is research, but I'm going to, I'm going to stop streaming and think about this privately and let you know, I'll let you know my thoughts. Thank you for joining me.